So today what I want to talk about is uh, kind of the experience I've had recently working within uh, Citrix and the uh, Apache organization with CloudStack. Um, so this is me. Um, so right now I'm working for Citrix as a cloud computing evangelist, uh, which means, you know, I, I go around and I preach about the values of open source and cloud. Uh, also a cloud stack committer, which I actually kind of uh, take very seriously. And then uh, I'm a recovering tech journalist, so some of you may know me from back when I used to do that kind of thing. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at the JZB, or if you want to tweet anything about the talk, that would be me. Uh, and just uh, email me at jzb at zonker.net. Uh, so, before I joined Citrix and before I relapsed into tech journalism, I was working for a company called Novell. Uh, and I was working with this project as the uh, community manager, which is a misnomer if I've ever heard one. Um, you know, because there is no such thing as managing an open source community, right? That is not the job. The job is, it really should be something like community enabler or something like that. But I worked with, uh, with Novell and with OpenSUSE for two years, and the job was basically to try to grow the OpenSUSE community and work with the community. Uh, and one of the things that is tough when you're working for a company is you're really not working for these guys, you're working for them. Uh, and this is one of the hard parts in working for, you know, in open source is really you're working for a company that has maybe different goals than the people you want to contribute to the company, to the project. And I would say that when I was working there, Novell's, uh, you know, what they wanted to do with OpenSUSE was generally, I hate to use this term, but in alignment with what the community wanted, but occasionally what they wanted to do was not. And therein you get to be in a problem. Do you wear the corporate hat or do you wear the company or the community hat? Um, you know, you can't be of much use to the community if you get fired, but you're of no use to the community if you're, you know, just towing the corporate line. And sometimes companies want you to do things that are not good for a community because they're clueless. Sometimes they want you to do things that are not good for a community because, you know, they have a different agenda. Uh, sometimes they just don't know what they're doing. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so now I have the pleasure of working within a foundation. Now, Apache is not the only software foundation. There are a lot of different foundations. Uh, my experience comes so far with working with Apache. I've also worked as a contractor with the Linux Foundation. Uh, they have a very different model in terms of how they work with like the Linux kernel in their, in their work groups. Uh, but you also have Free Software Foundation. You have Eclipse, which I think is much closer to Apache. You have Outer Curve. You have the uh, Conservancy. You have the Free Software Foundation. There are a lot of different groups that try to provide services and an umbrella around free software and open source communities. But so I'm going to try to stick, be more general, but a lot of my experience comes from Apache. Uh, last year, there was an article that made the rounds or a post that made the rounds, Apache considered harmful. Uh, and basically, the guy was saying that, you know, Apache is sort of crusty, they, you know, they're slow to move, GitHub is a much better place to do work in open source communities, you know, open source or uh, GitHub has better tools for communities, things like that. Um, and he made a couple of good points and he had some legitimate complaints with the way that Apache worked, but I think that he ignored a number of things um, that I like about open source. Uh, foundation. So, one of his points was that companies no longer find open source scary. And uh, it, I can't think of a better term to use than bullshit. <laughs> so th this, by the way, is meant to invoke scary. Some of these slides are more abstract concepts. Uh, that anybody who's seen Cabin in the Woods would be familiar with this. If you have not seen this movie, you definitely need to rent it if you like horror movies of any kind. Uh, but it's not true that, that, com that companies don't find open source scary. What is true is they have gotten over the fear of using open source. And to some extent, they've gotten over the fear of the licenses. Uh, unless you're talking about GPLv3, in which case they're still scared to death of that. <laughs> um, but, you know, for the most part, companies are still afraid of open source doing it the right way because they're afraid of giving up control. They're afraid of giving up their way of doing things. They're afraid of you know, well, what if we what if we start something and our competitors want to do it? What if you know what happens then? It's completely untrue to say that companies are are you know on board with open source the way they should be. 
the way I view foundations is sort of like a personal trainer. Um, has anybody ever worked with a personal trainer? A couple folks. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not currently working with a personal trainer, <laughs> but I have. And uh, the thing about a personal trainer is this. It's like you, you have a goal. You want to get to a certain place. You need some guidance on how to get there. Now. The odds are, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, um, the odds are if they told you exactly what was going to happen and how you were going to feel during that process, you would never go back. That's why they make you, it's not, it's not just because they want your money, that's why they make you sign up for like eight weeks at a chunk. Because if you paid by session, the second session you would never show up. Um, and that's, that's kind of like working with an Apache. Um, there are rules that you have to follow. You know, there are certain things that you must do. And this is one of the things I love. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I said the likeness is striking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I like John Goodman. We're both from St. Louis. I'll take that. Um, all right. So one of the things I like about working within Apache is the fact that, for the most part, I don't have to argue that things are the right things to do to Citrix or somebody else. Okay. With Novell, I would have to go back. I'll give an example. There was a project Novell had open sourced when they had their first burst of open source enthusiasm, uh, iFolder. And then they basically retracted it. Uh, the business, they got switched in business units and basically the people who inherited the, the iFolder project basically said, you know, meh, open source, meh, we don't want to do that. And what happened was you had this whole community of people saying, are you guys ever going to release the code? Are you, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Are you going to maintain the website? Are you going to clear out the spam in your forms? Anything. And they wouldn't even respond, okay? <laughs> Uh, within a, within a uh, foundation, and I'll talk about this a little bit, you have a structure that you kind of have to follow. I, kept, I spent nine months inside Novell getting them to finally start releasing code again for a brief period. Uh, and it, it just took forever because I had to go, go in there and keep arguing. It's like, you guys, we need to do this. It's making the company look bad. It's killing our other communities. Um, you know, if that, if that had been an Apache project, that wouldn't have been as a problem. It's basically you must continue to do things in the open. Um, one of the things I like about Apache is the incubation process. Basically, you don't just dump things onto GitHub and say, here's a project. You actually have people who work with you, and you have a process to follow. You know, GitHub is a great tool, but it doesn't provide any structure for a project. It doesn't provide any guidance on how you should do an open source project. Um, so I, that's one of the reasons I don't think that Apache has yet become um, unnecessary because GitHub provides great tools, you know, other software forges provide great tools, but they are littered with dead projects and with poorly run projects. You have mentoring. Sure. Um, by the way, I, I meant to warn everybody up front, there are a lot of law cats in this presentation, sorry. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I like about it is you do have mentors. You have people who have been through the process and know the process that work with you that are out, usually outside your company who are going to guide you through the process. And by the way, what I'm talking about is not always, you know, this isn't for every open source project. I'm, my frame of reference is specifically projects where companies have an interest, companies the size of Novell or Citrix or IBM, which are not all the same size, but bigger companies all have an interest in participating together. I'm not talking about, you know, some little open source project that uh, decodes YouTube videos or something or something. Yeah, I'm talking about projects that have large corporate interests. You have community over code as part of the Apache process. You basically have this idea that it's more important to have a functional community than the particular code. Now obviously, as open source developers or users, you want good code. But one of the things a lot of companies do is they basically just sort of lob code balls at their community. They don't actually build a community. They say, well, what, do you, what more do you want? You have functional code. That's important, but what happens when inevitably the company loses interest or changes its tactics or does something else? You don't have a community there to maintain the code. What you have is a beautiful project that's going to degrade in most cases. You have infrastructure. One of the things that I don't I love about GitHub is anybody can sign up and have a GitHub account and put code up. One of the things I hate, both as a user of open source, as a tech journalist, whatever hat I'm wearing. There is no idea that, you know, if you put something on, on GitHub, you must have documentation. There is no idea that you must have a website beyond the little page that GitHub gives you. you. You don't have any enforcement of any kind of infrastructure beyond what's on GitHub or SourceForge. 
Um, and without that infrastructure, you can't have a functioning open source project without mailing lists or some forums or some way for people to communicate. Without documentation, without information, you can't really have a functional, fully functional open source project in my opinion. You have reporting. What this is what I'm talking about with reporting is uh, is an incubating project in Apache. You have to basically every month or every quarter you have to say this is our progress. This is where we're getting towards graduation. You actually have to you know show accountability to somebody. Uh, which again, you don't have that on GitHub. You put some code up on GitHub, you're done, right? Uh, you don't have anybody monitoring your progress or checking your waistline or anything like that. You just have, you know, well, I've done a check in the last six months, I'm good. Uh, membership. You actually have, one of the problems I've seen with a number of open source communities is you have people who want to contribute, who do contribute, and somehow, because the project is run by a company instead of a, uh, you know, a neutral organization, they can't quite get involved in the core of that project or as a committer in that project because they don't have the woofy to contribute to somebody's code repository on inside the firewall or they you know they don't know the right people. Uh, Apache does not have like a completely standardized way of accepting people, but they, they have a loose set of guidelines towards how you become a committer. And there's a problem with a community that would be recognized if somebody is constantly you know, showing up with good patches or showing up and doing good things for the community and they couldn't get accepted as a committer. And vice versa. There are processes for saying someone is no longer contributing to a project or somebody has no business being in a project um, because they're not doing anything for the project. Just because I worked for Citrix, I did not get commit access to Apache Cloud Stack on day one. I spent several months working on the website, doing some work on licensing and documentation before the PPMC, the folks that are mentoring that, uh, actually said, okay, we think you've done enough, we want to give you your stripes so you can actually commit, we don't have to look over everything that you do. And I think that's the way it should be. Just because you work for IBM doesn't mean you should be able to donate code to one of the projects they're interested in. Um, you contribute as an individual, not as like a sock puppet. This is, you know, kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. Um, does anybody David recognize David 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 Mr. 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 Fibble? Mr. Fibble. Very upset. <laughs> <laughs> I very can't. Upset with you. Yes. I, I can't do the voice, actually. Um, but anyway, one of my favorite episodes here. But, you know, basically, I contribute as me, okay? I take off the Citrix hat when I walk into the Apache room, and I have to do, you know, the rules say I need to do what I think is best for the project, not necessarily what's best for Citrix. So far, that hasn't really been a conflict or a problem. Uh, but if it ever is, I know what I'm, I know what I should do, um, and I'm willing to do the right thing by the project because that's the agreement that I signed, that's the contributor agreement that I signed, and that's what I signed up for. You have legal rules and guidelines. One of the most painful parts that we've been going through uh, to get ready for our first release in CloudStack is actually making sure that everything is legally compliant so Apache can say, we stand behind this release. And why is that important? Well, it's not just important as an open source project, it's important because the code that we're uh, producing is gonna be consumed by a lot of companies and the Apache brand says, you know, you can take this code and not worry about it because we've already worried about it. Um, and I'm sure that's true of several other foundations. Basically, they're endorsing that they have done some due diligence and they know that the code is, they know the provenance of the code, they have the agreements, so far, uh, so on and so forth. I've been steaming through this. Anybody have any questions, or am I putting you to sleep, or is everybody just looking for 1230 to get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that this one in particular, you see a big gradient in exactly, like eclipses legal auditing versus, uh, you know, like Ecl Eclipse is super, super paranoid about this, mm -hmm. uh, Apache less so, uh, and some, you know, way, way less. Is so. Apache less paranoid than Eclipse? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I'm so glad I'm working in an Apache project. <laughs> <laughs> that explains so a lot we, about the last six months of my life, isn't it? Yeah. When you're talking about provenance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about provenance and legal uh, legal vetting. Like yeah. they, we, of, we have gone down to the level of actually verifying that config files for third-party programs are either licensed Apache or okay, like public domain. I, I'm on the license mailing list. Yeah, so you yeah. see that. So um, yeah, no, but uh, Eclipse does 
even more than that. I mean, that's part of the eclipse's provenance, right? I mean, it came out of IBM. Yeah. Right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wants, yeah. wants to be able to continue. IBM's very business. relaxed about everything. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose from all the different shades of black for your tie. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so anyway, but I, I find this very important, and it's something that you certainly don't get on GitHub, right? You have people putting stuff up and they don't even give you a license file. You haven't the slightest idea of the provenance of the code or what the license is. Um, I would see, when I was writing for Read Write Web, I would see stuff come up on, on Y Combinator, right? And say, oh, this looks like an interesting project, I'll write about it. One of the things I like to include in an article is what the license is, and half the time I'd look at it, I, do you have a license? You know, it's, it, I had no idea. I ended up having to email the guy and be like, right, license, of course. Uh, it's Apache. Really? Where does it say that? Give me five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the commit. It's, um, it's worth pointing out that if you run across something on GitHub and there is no license, yeah. the default is all rights reserved. You actually can't do anything with it. You have okay. to, someone has and, to. And has that's to what I would assume. If I don't see a license, I would assume it. But I mean, Yes. Yeah. So, so two things. Historically, GitHub said you can only host on our you can only host on our public unpaid thing if you are open source, right? Without ever means. defining what the hell that meant. Right. right. Um, it means you publish the code, right? Yeah. <laughs> the second, there's a lot of companies that say we're open source because you can see our code. And that's yeah. Why right. 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 Okay. But shared source. Was the I, I mean, <laughs> they don't. They still say. Open. The, I mean, the other the other thing is is that. Um, to, to, to put sort of a quantifying on what he's saying there. there I, I talk to people sometimes and they're like, oh, but whatever, who cares if it doesn't have a license? Uh, I get paid by people all the time to write that email and say like, you know, oh, tell me what the license is because I have a client who wants to know. Yeah. Like, anytime a lawyer gets involved, if you cause the lawyer to be involved, that's a failure, right? Yeah. If, you, if, if you could fix that by putting a copying file in there, like, yeah. Reduce friction, make the world a better place, do it. I, I like your rule, by the way. Anything you've done to make a lawyer be involved is a failure. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell my boss I said that. <laughs> Tweet that. Tweet that. <laughs> it, slows, it, slows, it slows things down immensely. Um, the, the, the thing I'd really like to see on GitHub is what uh, SourceForge used to have, which is just a drop down. Yeah. 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 What license yeah. is it? That, that would make my life so much easier. That would be great. Yeah, I think they should. Do well, that. Where, where's, where's Ryan? Ryan? Can we, there, where's the GitHub? Yeah, Ryan, just have they changed that? Have they at least forced you to indicate a license? No, no. And they only suggest that in readme. They don't bother doing So, if it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Uh, this is one of the most important rules any foundation should have if they don't have this rule. The reason why. Uh, I work very closely with a guy named David Nally, who's in the project, and we travel together a lot, and we're both involved in CloudStack. It would be very, very easy for us to make project decisions on a plane or over dinner or something like that, that nobody else in the project would be aware of until it happened. Um, it's very easy for engineers. You know, we have, we have folks in India, we have folks in California. Um, when I used to work with Novell, we had development offices in, in uh, Boston, we had development offices, or sorry, Cambridge, we had development offices in Nuremberg and Prague. And it was so easy for three guys to get together in Nuremberg and talk about something and make a project decision and then announce it. And everybody else would say, it, wait, it, isn't this an open source project? Should we have talked this through? And there was no rule to say, well, you need to do this. And I love the fact that you can basically retract the decision if you can show that, hey, this didn't happen on the mailing list. People didn't get a chance to weigh in. They're concerned about the entire life cycle. Can, yeah. can I ask a question about that? Sure. So how do you, um, what do you recommend then for the process of setting, defining a strong centralized vision for what the project should be? So my experience is that doing that out in the open on a mailing list often ends very badly. <laughs> um, that's a, it's a really good question. I don't know that it's a solved problem. Um, but I think that it's better you know, when you have a project like CloudStack, our vision was kind of set when they donated it to Apache. Now, it's going to change over time more than likely because we're already seeing a lot of involvement. Um, for a brand new project, which happens, uh, where people propose something before there's even any code, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but you can see the same thing even on board. Or like a charter space on the website? Or like, you know, no. what, what are we trying to do with this anyway? There's a description of the project, but I don't think we have a formalized charter or anything like that. I mean, there was actually, there was something when it was proposed to Apache, so um, 
but as far as revising that, I don't know the process, and I don't know how Eclipse or Outer Curve would handle it. Um, yeah. So, so how does Apache deal with uh, a lot of open source projects have kind of the benevolent dictator for life? Sure. How, how does that work? We don't have that. You, it isn't really an allowed structure for the project. No. Um, and and you know, and I'm not, by the way. I'm a big fan of this for, like I said, certain kinds of projects. It doesn't mean that, you know, the benevolent dictator thing doesn't work with certain people. You know, Linus, for example, is the obvious example. And he has spent 20 plus years building up cred as that community's benevolent dictator. What's going to happen when Linus steps aside or whatever is going to be a really interesting question. Well, the Python um, community went through that and they got Python 3 as a result. <laughs> uh, without a comment on whether Python 3 was a good or a bad thing. That's just an observation. Okay. <laughs> One observation I've had, though, is for people entering the open source world that have been in the proprietary world, mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand not having a benevolent dictator because they're used to that kind of hierarchical structure. I, I would remove have... the benevolent from that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think... But it, in their corporate structure, they're used to a hierarchical approach to managing a project. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but in the foundation, you know, a lot of foundations do have a hierarchy, right? Yeah. It's just that their hierarchy is not, you know, I started the project, thus I own it for life. Right. And I would say, work, having worked on both sides of the fence now, just because you're actually even in a closed source company doesn't mean that direction coming from on high is not greeted with a great amount of turmoil and it was never on the mailing list and you never discussed this. With yeah. <coughs> So I think the same problem is irregardless of open source or not open source. I think that problem about where the product is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fair. Yeah. It happens in both environments fairly frequently. Yeah. So not to put you in an awkward position, but I'd be interested. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> yes. It was bound to happen. But, uh, um, I'd love to hear your comments on the OpenStack Foundation and how they've gone about doing it. And <laughs> are they doing it right, wrong? Um, or even eucalyptus. But just, um, to be fair, they've only just started. So, so just, but yeah, just the way that they're approaching it. I haven't, I can't honestly comment on a lot of details because I have not watched it that closely. I, say, I would say that they've made choices I wouldn't necessarily have made. We'll see if they work out. I, I, it's, it is new, and you know, and I think they're, they're making a lot of stuff up as they go along. That's not a criticism. That's just, they're moving with high velocity. They're doing a lot of things. By the way, just for the record, I have nothing bad to say about OpenStack. I have nothing bad to say about Eucalyptus. I, you know, as long I'll say the same thing I used to say about Linux, which is, you know, in 1999, I worked for a company called Linux Mall. We sponsored the .org at Atlanta Linux Fest and other places, and we would, you know, we let BSD folks take place in there. And you know, our line is basically it was free Unix. It's all good. And same thing, it's open cloud, it's all good. I would prefer that people, you know, I'd love to see cloud stack be the number one whatever, uh, but that doesn't mean there's not room for you good and open stack. So, yeah, Paul. Yeah, just one observation because I've, I've actually managed four non open source nonprofits and I, I use this law firm, um, Guys Smart Up to Grove in Boston, and they've done about 50 of them in the last couple of decades with high tech. This is a, a the open stack trajectory is very predictable. Mm -hmm. It happens a lot when you have corporations that decide they want to invest in something, decide they want a, a tra trajectory that's nonprofit. Mm -hmm. They're using internal corporate lawyers that are used to for-profit structures. Yeah. Um, they're not going outside and seeking the, r the right counsel. And invariably, they'll end up seeking counsel and re re redoing it you know, right. a year or two years, which is exactly what happened with OpenStack. Two years ago, they were had a completely different plan on paper, and they've completely evolved as they've gotten the right resources and, and the feedback from the community to make the changes on governance. Yeah, and if it's going to be successful, they'll keep taking feedback. And you know, it's Apache isn't perfect, and OpenShift or uh, OpenStack isn't perfect, and you know, OpenShift we'll is. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> OpenShift <laughs> is. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So let's move on. So what I want to say about this. Uh, Apache and other foundations are concerned about the entire life cycle of the project, not just starting it, not just putting code out there. Um, you know, there's a point where you look at a project and you either say, this project is not, it's, it's just not thriving, or it's, it's run its course or whatever, and it's time to close it down. Okay. Um, five minutes, okay. Um, basically, you know, a lot of projects that are put up on GitHub or a lot of projects that are sponsored by companies, they don't go through the end life cycle properly. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, pay attention to when the project is ready to be shut down or when it needs help. 
So there are five stages that companies tend to go through when they're working with foundations. So I'm a big fan of foundations, but there are some things you have to prepare for. Basically, you've got the five stages of grief. Okay. The first one is denial. Okay. Companies are like, "What? We have to wait? Really? We have to follow this rule? Really? You know, we have to do it what way? No, that doesn't make sense." Next, anger. You know, <laughs> 72 hours. We got to wait 72 hours for people to make a decision. We're used to walking down the hall and having a decision. What do you mean we have to put it on the mail? Then you have bargaining. Okay, let's see if we can get, you know, I know that, you know, there are 500 other organizations in Apache, but let's see if we can get this rule accepted for us because <laughs> our community is different. <laughs> Charter or anything like that. I mean, there was actually, there was something when it was proposed to Apache, so, um, but as far as revising that, I don't know the process and I don't know how Eclipse or Outer Curve would handle it. Uh, yeah? So, so how does Apache deal with uh, a lot of open source projects have it? Kind of the benevolent dictator for life. Sure. How, how does that work? We don't have that. You, it isn't really an allowed structure for the project. No. Um, and and you know and I'm not by the way, I'm a big fan of this for like I said certain kinds of projects. It doesn't mean that you know the benevolent dictator thing doesn't work with certain people. You know Linus, for example, is the obvious example, and he has spent 20 plus years building up cred as that community's benevolent dictator. What's going to happen when Linus steps aside or whatever is going to be a really interesting question. Well, the Python um, community went through that and they got Python 3 as a result. <laughs> uh, without a comment on whether Python 3 was a good or a bad thing. That's just an observation. Okay. <laughs> One observation I've had, though, is for people entering the open source world that have been in the proprietary world, mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand not having a benevolent dictator because they're used to that kind of hierarchical structure. I, I would remove that. the benevolent from that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think but in their corporate structure, they're used to a hierarchical approach to managing a project. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, but in the foundation, you know, a lot of foundations do have a hierarchy, right? It's yeah. just that their hierarchy is not, you know, I started.